were imposed through legislation. A chorus of media commentators used the McCarthy Report, which was commissioned by the government, probably to do just that, in a disgraceful campaign of vilification against public servants and to foster a spurious division between private and public sector workers. Inevitably, industrial action ensued, but the government abandoned the pre-budget negotiations last December when an agreement was practically completed to appease those who believe that conflict and division is preferable to agreement and progress. Further industrial action saw the talks resume in mid-March under the auspices of the Labour Relations Commission. Now the final proposals from these talks are for decision by the public sector unions. There are two components to the agreement for each sector of the public sector. The common component for all is the pay stabilisation and restoration proposals and the negotiation of pension proposals. The second component is the sector specific changes that are intended to generate cost savings in that sector. In education, the changes proposed come under four headings. One, an extra period of availability for SNS. Two, a redeployment scheme for surplus teachers. Three, a non-teaching non contracted hour. And four, a revision of the teaching contract to maximize teaching time. Viewed from a traditional trade union perspective, this agreement is regressive and inadequate. As Standing Committee has intimated in last Thursday's press release, there are many reasons to vehemently oppose it. There is no firm timetable to restore the pay cuts. The one-hour non-teaching contractual imposition shows no appreciation of the voluntary flexibility and engagement of teachers in a broad range of duties and extracurricular activities. And the key issue, the contract, the scope of the contract review is too vague. In summary, the most disappointing aspect of these proposals is that they show a total lack of respect and trust in teachers. In rejecting this agreement, we must ensure that it is the best way of protecting ourselves from these regressive changes. We must have a considered appraisal of the broader strategic and contextual dimensions of this agreement. That is absolutely necessary. We do live in the real world, and we are aware of the realities. The finances of this state are in a, in a precarious imbalance due to the burden of the massive debt created by reckless banking policies. Fiscal stabilization is vital for education funding. And is this deal the best available in those circumstances? We must seriously consider other implications, the implications for industrial action and so forth. Whatever we decide this week, it is essential that the full strategic and contextual considerations of both acceptance and rejection are fully comprehended by every ASTI member. And above all, we must remain resolute, confident, and united at this crucial juncture. The recent Irish Times series on renewing the Republic featured an article by Declan Kyber of UCD, the professor of English, which had contained observations that are relevant to education. He said, trainee teachers on their practice in schools were expected to draw up detailed printed plans for eight lessons in a single day, while also providing self-assessment reports on each of the eight lessons given already on the same day. People were seized by the crazy idea that information is knowledge and that everything worth knowing could be measured. They became so busy using the new technology to document life that many of them lost the art of living it. 
I conclude my quotation from Mr. Kyber's article with the quotation he used from Einstein, and it's very relevant to the proposal in front of us. What counts can't always be counted, and what can be counted doesn't always count. I compliment the Teaching Council, and Pat McPhail said he'd be glad of that. I compliment the Teaching Council on commissioning a survey which was carried out in November 2009 on public attitudes to the teaching profession. Of the 12 professions and occupations referenced in the survey, teachers ranked second in terms of satisfaction levels. Teachers are trusted. The complexity of teaching and the skill levels required is understood especially by parents the survey concluded. At a time when teachers and other public servants were getting the hair dryer treatment, to use an Alex Ferguson line, in some media commentator, the survey results were very reassuring. Teachers in Ireland are generally fortunate in the respect for learning and education that still permeates our society. We were once known as the island of saints and scholars. A readiness to learn by students and the support of parents and guardians is essential for effective teaching and learning. Many parents and guardians perform many miracles in the face of economic, social and personal difficulties to support the education of their children. Each of us as teachers have our own experience of the superhuman efforts that parents make to support the education of their daughters and sons. The great majority of students put in a huge, put a huge effort into their studies. But the vision of a broad, holistic education that seeks to develop the full potential of each student is now more essential than ever. Sean Higgins, in his presidential address in 1995, spoke profoundly on this issue, and I quote, the pursuit of a single academic goal at leaving certificate level denies students their right to a happy, and fulfilling school experience. The ever narrowing curriculum now on offer, which often excludes subjects like music, art and PE, sits uncomfortably with our rich cultural and sporting history and is surely a cause for great regret and concern. And we join with Sean in this part. Here I want to praise the extraordinary efforts of these countless teachers who willingly devote many hours and days of their time to extracurricular activities such as sport, drama, and musicals. Our teachers are still enthusiastic and well motivated, but I must warn that such generosity is fragile, and attempts to extract more on a contractual basis will surely lead to a drop-off in extracurricular activities, as has recently happened in the United Kingdom. In the chair. Sean's reference to contractual issues are, of course, very relevant in the current situation. A recent ASGI survey of its members' attitudes to voluntary activities in the context of industrial action showed that the commitment and enthusiasm of teachers to the broader hidden curriculum that so enriches our education continues to flourish in our schools. Craig Barrett, who Garrod referred to earlier, the recently retired chairman of technology giant Intel, has emphasized the importance of education in the recovery of the Irish economy. And we agree with him on that. He said the future of Ireland's economy will be directly related to the quality of workforce and the quality of Ireland's workforce will be dependent on education capabilities. He said a significant investment in mathematical and scientific teaching is required. Yet, a recently released ASGI survey on science education shows that science subjects such as physics and chemistry are being lost to school subject occupants due to the reduction in last year's pupil-teacher ratio. <laughs> the involvement of industry and business interests in education is welcome, but the educational debate driven by the needs of industry and business alone is very damaging. Educationists must speak up for education 
and the education debates about the smart economy, maths education, science education, curricular reforms, grade inflation, etc., etc., must be informed by educationists, 